It's a real pleasure to be with Lori Olson, who's a physical therapist at Utah State University in Logan. And she's worked with countless injured athletes over the past 23 years and has been at Utah State University for the past 18 years. So thank you for being here and sharing your insights and experience, Lori. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Maybe you can talk a little bit about a little bit more about your background and, and your work experience. Okay. Yeah, I've been up at Utah State um, for the for 18 years and uh, I started just up at the Student Health Center and just seeing students and, and some of the athletes. And as we got a new building built, uh, I got to move over to the athletic piece only. And um, it's a beautiful facility with underwater treadmills and uh, it's just right in the training room. So I am working closely with the athletic training staff and um, the, the athletes can are just right there on campus. And so I'm able to work with them both up on in the training room as well as with the athletic trainers and close to the coaches. And I just feel like it's been a great ability to communicate with everyone involved for the athlete. And I've learned lots just through working both with the athletic trainers as well as the strength coaches. So that uh, that's, you know, that mainly, and I mainly see the athletes that are surgical. So a lot of times they'll start in my hands um, after surgery and I'll work them towards getting ready for the athletic trainer, whether it's in practice and or progressing them to the strength coach as well and getting them back in the weight room. Mm -hmm. And we just really work as a team, a team approach. And it's just been a really fun position to be able to evolve I, since I was the first one up there and with the new building it's just been kind of a fun position to be able to progress uh, over time really <laughs> yeah so. it, it sounds like you have access not only to great facilities but also you mentioned a um, really strong team of uh, other uh, providers Maybe you can speak a little bit more about the value of treating athletes within a team framework. Right. The, um, I, I just feel like it's a perfect scenario to be able to have the athlete be in the hands of a, an entire team. I think we all bring our expertise and yet they all overlap as well. And you know, that when they start in my hands and they're starting with physical therapy, it's kind of on the cute side of it. And yet we can still discuss with the strength coach, you know, right away, is there something they, else they can be doing? Can they be doing some upper body if it's a lower extremity injury, as well as on the athletic trainer part, you know, is there anything that they can be doing practice? And, and if not, you know, when can we start that? We really do a lot of communication with that. I think it helps both on the mental aspect, because they know we're all on the same page, but it also helps, you know, physically, if during practice, they're just sitting and watching, if they can be sitting and watching on a bike, you know, that takes some time away from me that I have to spend with them. But it's utilizing their time, you know, well during the day, as well as, you know, they've just proven over time that if we're, the more that we're doing in the safe manner to keep them in shape, the the better the process goes and i think that's just that that's what the team approach does right. is just really be able to look at all that they possibly could do during each stage of the injury and be able to to progress them as smoothly and as quickly as we can during that those stages sure and and would you say that a focus on thinking about what the athlete can be doing rather than their limitations or restrictions is important in their recovery? So important, so important on there. And I think, you know, at the beginning of the injury, if you can sit down and talk them through that process, especially, uh, let's, you know, let, having them know that we're thinking that way, thinking of here's what we can do in this stage and this is why we can't do it, but here's when we can start to do it. And, and I think letting them be a part of that, of what, what are they concerned about? What are they, you know, what would they want to be doing and giving them a feel of what they can and can't do, depending on their sport, their position, that type of thing. I think then they give their, um, 
you know, perspective of why are they really need to focus or stressed about, have anxiety about. And if you can outline that process, whether it's going to be with me, the physical therapist, or here's when we're going to start with the strength coach. Uh, I, I just think it's huge for them to see that we're letting them do as much as they can and maybe giving them a perspective of why they can't and when they can just really lets them have a sense of, I guess, understanding and know what's next, get excited for the next step. Sure. Uh, we meet like with the strength coaches, like on, for football, I meet with them on every Monday. And we're always talking about what they can do next, what would be the next step. And, uh, the, and the kid knows that, the athlete knows that, you know, we've been discussing that. And I think that just helps them feel taken care of as well, that they're mm -hmm. cared for and that their needs are being cared for, you know, and, and especially when multiple people are looking at, you know, the best interest for them. Sure. Is that important for the athlete to know that they're cared for? A hundred percent. Um, I, and I, I feel like I've even seen research that said that, it, you know, it makes for a better outcome if they yeah. have felt that they're being taken care of, whether it's by the doctor or the physical therapist, uh, the trainer, uh, I think that positiveness is just, is huge. But, but yeah, I think they need to know that we're, we're not looking at them as just another injury, another person, another player, that they're, word is you know their expectations are being met as well as anything special for them whether it's because of their position or because of their sport or just their personality i feel like they need to to know that we really care about them as a person what's what's exactly are they going through right now and and are we going to meet that those expectations of them yeah i i want to come back to that point about athlete expectations uh, but certainly to your comments about caring and its value, we, I actually had a former doctoral student, Lindsay Graviscus, who was looking at patients with neurological diseases, so Parkinson's patients, not an athletic population, of course, but we were actually looking at that idea of caring from the physical therapist and whether it increased their confidence, not only in themselves, but also in the confidence of their treatment provider and their belief that the treatment provider believed in them. And we found that when the, uh, the physical therapist engaged in certain caring behaviors, so uh, things like taking time to get to know the patient, what their, their uh, interests were in terms of being able to move or carry out day-to-day -day functions, um, you know, sort of giving them some time and, and rationales, as you mentioned, or information when the patient perceived that caring, that it had beneficial consequences for their, their confidence beliefs and subsequently their compliance with the, the rehabilitation. So I, I thought that was an interesting comment. Right. Um, go ahead, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think a lot of times if you really sit down and listen to the athlete of where you know, what they're wanting to do or what their stresses are, their anxiety is, I think it's come back to help me actually help them, if that makes sense. So yeah. sometimes you're just trying to, you're kind of going through the motions and every, every person kind of approaches injury just a little bit different. And I think if you can get to know the athlete and, and kind of even maybe how they were as an athlete and just really listen to them, they can actually help you help them in the sense of just, right. you know, if they, they needed to do this every day and this is what they focused on and that's what they need to get back to and you can get them back to that. It, it just is a huge part of their process. And every athlete I've just decided is, is just a little bit different of what, what is important to them, you know, what's their stresses. And a lot of times if you can just listen to them, you can almost take that away by, you know, either, talking them through it and what's that process going to be or or allowing them you know to be doing a certain thing i don't know it's just whatever their kind of catch it makes them them mm -hmm. if you can feed that into their recovery i feel like it makes it such a better recovery for them yeah. and they feel a part of it and i think as soon as they are feeling a part of it and you're helping them do that it, it can go a lot smoother that's for sure right so when you say they feel part of it does that mean they have a sense of ownership or responsibility in the process, or maybe you can elaborate more on, on your point there. Right. 
Probably a little bit of both of that. Uh, I think if you can talk them through what the process is going to be in a sense of working through maybe the rehab goals, as well as if you can get to know their part of their sport goals and make sure that your rehab goals are matching, you know, their sport sport goals as well. Sure. Uh, and then actually having them help you make their goals. And some of it is your own specific rehab goals that are, you know, a little bit standard, but I think every sport kind of creates new different goals and whether it's uh, a certain, um, you know, what they felt they needed to do to stay in shape for their sport. If yeah. they did a certain, you know, amount of, I ran this much or I used to do this and you can talk them into being able to make little goals back towards that, then yeah, they're feeling like they're having ownership, but they're also, they're also feeling like we're listening to them and our goals aren't just standard goals. They're right. goals that are, are helping them be back to where they were prior to and so, yeah, a little bit of responsibility, putting it in their hands. These are your, these, this is what you need to do each day. This is what I'm going to help you do each day. And also, you know, ownership in, in how we're going to do this. Cause I think, sure. I don't think it is standard. I think there's a little bit of a backbone of what we do that needs to be done for each uh, diagnosis. But, but I think every kid's just a little bit different of how we really need to approach it. And they can help us create that just a little bit more. Right. specific for them. Right. So when they articulate their goals and, and what they're aspiring to return to or achieve, it sounds like that helps you tailor the program a bit or integrate some of that information or feedback into the program itself. Exactly. And then you can pull the other, uh, you know, entities, whether it's the strength coach, the coaches, the athletic trainer in on all of that as well and, mm -hmm. and be able to really tailor you know, the whole process to them. And I think you usually get a lot better recovery, a lot better uh, smoothness, I guess, in the process, if it's being tailored to what they're, what they need. Sure. And as from a physical therapist standpoint, is it also important to have an understanding of the specific uh, tasks of uh, player positions or, you know, like, in football, for instance, of course, the quarterback may need to be able to do different things than a lineman or a cornerback and to integrate kind of those elements of, of their position into the rehabilitation. Yes, I feel like it is really helpful. And I think you learn over time to be able to, you know, really truly understand all those positions. But if you, if it's a new sport and a new position that you don't quite understand, if you can get that from the athlete to really explain, maybe explain what kind of drills they do, explain what, you know, what, what's important for them is getting back into the weight room important for them, or is it getting back on the field and more running and agility? What, or is it being, is it conditioning? Is it endurance? You know, what is, what is their main thing that they need to be focusing on? You know, if it is a quarterback, they're always uh, really stressed about being able to throw, keep their arm in shape. You know, when is that possibility of just even them being able to throw sitting down and then being able to progress that? So, yeah, I think if the more that you are attuned to positions, even sports, how they practice, uh, the better you can really tailor uh, your own rehab for them, yeah. as well as help them of what they can be doing on the days that maybe they're not coming in and what they can be doing on their own. Mm -hmm. And especially at the end of the process when they're really close to getting back into sport. That's where if you're communicating with their, I really like to communicate with their own coach. Maybe it's their positional coach, or maybe it's just the head coach, whichever coach that they spend more time with. If you can get their perspective of what they're stressed about, what do they need the kid to get back into doing, right. then you can help that whole process as well, kind of talk through that process. You know, he's not quite ready for this, but you guys could do this, this, and this, and then in a month, he'll be ready for that. And and I, I have always felt like the more that you can bring in um, for each athlete, more information of what everyone around them is wanting and kind of expecting, you can start to make a better plan for how that's going to, you know, work out. Sure. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit more, Lori, about the value of communication or effective communication between the different stakeholders, whether it's you and the coach or 
the athlete physical therapist's relationship. Right. I have just found that it, communication is huge. And I think for lots of reasons. One, I think, like we talked about before, the, the athlete just feels taken care of. And that, that because we're communicating, whether it's having meetings or, or how you want to do it, that the athlete really feels like everyone around them is caring for them. I think it really uh, calms down the anxiety of it all. If you can have a coach on the same page as the therapist as far as timeline and, and allow the athlete to know that that coach understands that there's a progression, that there's a timeline, you can take a lot of anxiety off of the athlete because I think things, the athlete puts a lot of stress on themselves. And a lot of times they don't realize that everyone around them understands this will be a process. Sometimes you find out that not everyone around does understand the process right, right. and needs to be um, a little bit more on the same page. And, but I have found that if, if you have an athlete just really full of anxiety, maybe a little stress, talking about uh, practice or getting back on the field or when I'm going to be, you know, when's going to be the first game I'm going to be able to play. And a, a lot of times if you can get even just one meeting of talking with everyone involved, whether it's a coach, the strength coach, and just put everyone in the same room and talk about what, you know, the next few months look like. Yeah, I feel like sometimes you never have to have another meeting because everyone's kind of on the same page. Everyone's talking to the kid the same. Every you know, everyone's basically progressing, and and the athlete feels I think it's just a lot more calm. Sure. Uh, I also think that you know when you're not having good communication, sometimes the, there's so many people trying to be involved, and some usually good intention, but sometimes you know sometimes they'll get into the weight room and they'll do too much or they'll get on in practice and they'll do too much. And now we've got, you know, increased pain, increased swelling, and now we're having to go backwards a little bit. And so a lot of times I feel like that's a lack of communication. That's not being able to put everyone on the same page of, of what needs to be done, what's too soon, you know, what, and what we should we be focusing on now. Right. It's just, it just creates so much of a smoother process sure. for, for everyone involved really and just knowledge and understanding so that if anything does create just a little bit of a hiccup everyone can be communicate communicating again and just get back on the same page and you know adjust whatever needs to be done i just think it creates a calmness around the athlete mm -hmm. because everyone around them is is being on the same page i guess right so i guess particularly during a time you mentioned when the athlete may already have anxiety or apprehension, having some common understanding or consistency of the progress or the progression of things that need to occur and, and getting everyone kind of buying into that sounds like it, it helps create that calm that you, you mentioned, which is, is valuable. Right. Well, and I think if you can start right off with good communication, you can avoid a lot of the unnecessary anxiety. Sure. But it's easier said than done. Like I, I say that and assume, you know, we, there's so many athletes and, and coaches, um, athletic trainers, strength coaches, they have a lot of people in their hands. And sometimes it's just depending on if you're in the middle of season where everyone's focus is, it, it's sometimes hard to have that real good communication. Yeah. And I think if you could do it right off the bat and it happened right away, you'd probably create a lot smoother process, but mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes it's just, you know, just part of the, the busyness of athletics. And yet if you start to see that anxiety and you start to see that there's some things that just aren't on the same page, if you can, you know, stop it in its tracks and get everyone back on the same page, whether it's just a quick meeting, uh, you know, quick phone calls, it's amazing what, just a little bit of that can just, you know, bring, bring back the, I don't know, just, yeah, like you said, consistency of the mm -hmm. process. Right. So when you talk about the value of getting everyone in the same room or having a meeting with all parties, all relevant parties involved, is that more the ideal or to what extent does that occur in practice? <laughs> I'd say it's more the ideal, uh, but I, I also think that as clinicians, we can really work on that. I think I have it a little easier being in a where I'm at 
in the you know in a building where we're we're all within a few buildings away and we can make it happen and it's still difficult but there's also a lot other scenarios where you know athletes get injured and they don't have that whole team around them and or the team's really spread out and and sometimes that is you know especially i look at the high school athlete a lot of times they just might just have a physical therapist with with them and they don't have a strength trainer they don't have the athletic trainer that's involved as much and and there's a lot less communication that needs to be done but i still think you find out who's in that who is in their group who mm -hmm. you know maybe it's straight calling the head coach and and talking to them about it but i think as a clinician clinician and i think physical therapists are probably the first main person that they usually are seeing and we're the ones that kind of push them out to to the other entities and i think if we can see who is in their group and if it's just it really might just be even a phone call. Maybe it's a note written, maybe it's an email of outlining the process. I think you have to be creative in, in the whole communicative process because process, I think a meeting sounds nice, but it's not always possible to. Mm -hmm. and, and yet there's other ways, whether it's just quick emails every week of just saying how they're doing. Maybe it's just outlining what they can do. Maybe it's talking to the parent because the parent's more involved and they're taking care of some of the strengthening or the running or what they can be doing. Uh, I think you, I think as a clinician, you have to be really creative and in, in knowing what the ideal would be and how can you work, you know, in the situation uh, maybe a little differently. Yeah. And would you say that as the a physical therapist with your knowledge of, of, injury and what's needed to progress recovery and also kind of the regularity of contact that you might see an athlete that in your in your role as a, a pt that you're well positioned to act as a liaison between different parties or individuals i do i i think we're the main ones that uh, understand and or we should we should take it on as far as knowing that it is important uh, and, and yet I'm not sure, you know, it depends on what kind of clinic you're at or, or where you're doing physical therapy. I think sometimes it's difficult, even with the, the lack of insurance, like a lot of times, you know, you look at an ACL, uh, reconstruction and insurance will only pay 20 visits for physical therapists. Yeah. And there's this big gap between the physical therapist and, and getting back on the field and and it it's kind of a wonder of who's who's seeing them during that time and sometimes it's strength and conditioning type uh individuals sometimes they're trying to do it on their own but i think we're still a part of that that process and and communicating to the people in the in the middle of that and and whether it's even just making sure that in the process we're seeing them multiple times and and maybe catching up right before they get back to sport to see you know is everything look like they should um but yeah i do feel like we're the liaison but i think it's hard it's hard to be the liaison as well um depending on your position i feel like i i do have it a little bit easier because i can i can do quick meetings with whoever is around but i also see some high school kids and and that's a, diff, a whole different scenario and yet I, I think it is our job. And I think if we took it on, I think we could do a better job of making sure that the athlete's ready to get back on the field. And it doesn't need to be all in our hands. It's just assisting the people that, that can be still part of the process and, yeah. and letting them understand, I guess, the importance of communicating and, and also going through the right process. Yeah. And, you know, you're alluding, I think, Lori, to some of the, constraints that physical therapists may work under in different contexts or sit settings. It sounds like you have a, a wonderful situation where you have access and resource again to different providers and people with different expertise, but also your physical proximity you mentioned being close in, in the buildings. Whereas for the high school athlete, it sounds like that's not necessarily uh, the case. Um, Maybe you talked a little bit earlier about athlete stress and anxiety. And I'm wondering what are some of the specific challenges that athletes face in their 
with respect to injury or, or their recovery. Right. I mean, I feel like that is a, there's so many, it's like, where do you start? Cause yeah. there's a lot of challenges for right. an athlete. Right. I mean, I think the first one is just that challenge of being taken away from their sport that, that they love. Um, whether it's short term or, or long term, I think that is just a huge challenge. And especially if it's their first big injury, uh, I think a lot of them have just never had time away from their sport. And so just mentally, I think that is just a, a, a real struggle for an athlete. And, you know, you always talk about how an athlete that that's their identity. And that's, you know, what what they kind of think of themselves is, is as, you know, a soccer player or a football player. And, and sometimes it's the first time that they've ever had that kind of questioned. And I, I think that's just a huge challenge for an athlete. I think the other thing is, is an athlete is usually just so driven and, and so used to just, you know, working so hard and, and being able to, uh, push themselves and have the competition and that challenge. And then all of a sudden that is just halted, you know, completely halted and they have to learn to be patient. They have to learn to, you know, slow down a little bit. And, and that, that drivenness will eventually be a huge component of them getting back. But there's, there's that time frame of maybe after surgery or just during the healing stage where, you know, that is having to be just kind of drop down and <laughs> mm -hmm. being able to really, uh, you know, not be able to kind of work through that is, it, it's such a hard thing for an athlete, I think, as far as yeah. just trying to learn how to deal with those emotions. Yeah. Um, another challenge I feel like is just, um, you know, wondering, or feeling that that they've let the team down, you know, depending on their position, letting, you know, everyone down around them. I think that is just a little bit of the mentality of an athlete, but, you know, you've got coaches around you, you've got parents around you, you've got your, your own teammates, and depending on, you know, when the injury happened, if it's during a season, it's during you know, a championship that's not going to, he, you know, they're not going to be able to play in and, and just letting people down. I feel like that is a huge uh, challenge for them to kind of deal with those emotions. Um, and then just the fear of just, am I ever going to get back to who I was? Am I ever going to play again? Uh, and even just the fear of, you know, what they have to go through <laughs> physically, you know, right. the fear of, being in a hospital and fear there's just there's so much emotion and, and anxiety just right off the bat that I I think they the other thing is I think an athlete is usually really tough they're tough-minded uh, you know they're used to kind of fighting through pain they're used to um, you know just keeping it in and not letting it letting that emotion out and I think they really struggle because they're struggling inside and some of them really try to keep it inside and try to be tough and put on this face that, that they're fine. And yet, you know, they're not, you know, they're not inside. And, and some of them are a lot more emotional and can't keep the emotions, you know, from coming. And I just, I feel for an athlete because they're just, they're trying to be tough in in a really tough situation. And I feel right. like that is just a huge challenge for them. Yeah. Yeah, as you mentioned, I guess just many facets of the injury experience that can be particularly difficult or arduous to deal with. I thought it was interesting that you talked about the drive and kind of determination of of the athlete mindset and that that's a quality that can serve them well during the rehabilitation, but it also sounds like it's something that you try to temper at times. Right, right. And I think that's, uh, especially in, you know, the injuries that they have to really just wait for a lot of healing. Um, it, I always think like knees are a little bit easier in some sense, especially if you can walk right away and we can, we can push them hard and that drivenness can just, you can use it right away. With shoulders, they're usually in a sling and 
you know, for eight weeks and you have to tell them you have to be really careful and safe and we can't do anything. And that, that combination of those two are just extreme and, and can be hard on both ends, you know? Right. So, but, what, what do you do or what suggestions, I guess, would you have for athletes in terms of trying to be patient when that may be inconsistent with the, the normal mindset of an athlete? Right. I, I think you talk them through it and talk, t- let them know that, that you know it's going to be hard, that this isn't your norm, and that I love your athletic um, you know, mentality, but this is a time to have to kind of you know, control it a little bit. I also think, though, you can, you can give them other things to be focusing on right. um, and, and give them some ideas. And again, I think that's coming from them as well of of talking, the, you know, to them about, you know, what else can we be doing? You know, I, I look at football players, they, they sit in the film room, you know, for, for lots more hours and they just learn that part of it. Or is it, you know, Hey, you, you struggled on, you know, if it's a shoulder and we can get your legs stronger and you can spend a little bit more time in the weight room right now and just work on your legs and, and I think you you refocus in something that they can um, be working on and take that drive and, and work on something. Yeah. Maybe it's learning the game a little bit more. Maybe it's, uh, I love when coaches bring them on the sideline and let them coach a little bit, or at least just be, um, have a, have a, you know, a job or something on the sideline. I think just sitting on the sideline and, and letting them know that, you know, you could be learning more, learn more about the game, listen to your coach more, maybe ask your coach for something that you could focus on during this time and try to refocus their drive. And maybe it's not on the field quite yet, and but it can be uh, something that will eventually make them better on the field. I think if you can get them to take that drive and maybe it's putting them into their, it, into their academics, you know, what, but kind of refocus where that, that drivenness can be. And I think they, then they can still use that, you know, that motivation and, and feel like they're, they're going to be a better athlete on the other end of it. And I, but I think that they don't always know that they're so into their, you know, um, maybe just being sad and upset and, and not really understand that they could take this time and, and be, become a little bit better at what they do and just a different aspect of it. I think we have to help them. I think coaches can be really good about that as well. Um, and sometimes if I know a kid is struggling a little bit and just doesn't quite know what to do with their time, I'll ask a coach if there's something, you know, they, they can see that they can be doing. Uh, it seems like it can be huge if they can just be focused and kind of putting their energy somewhere else. Yeah. And and then really letting them know, like, wh- when are you going to be able to start really working on this? Is it four weeks? Is it eight weeks? Then we're going to be working on this. And then we're going to, you know, really, again, that whole outline of what that process is going to be. Then they don't, they, they know it's not going to be forever. You know, this is the first four weeks. This is what we're going to be doing. We can't do much right now. But maybe you can be doing this, this, and this. And then at four weeks, we're going to step it up and really pick it up. And we're going to be you know, working on that, that you're concerned with. And so I feel like sometimes if you can just outline that process, then it settles them down a little bit, knowing that for one, we're going to, we're going to get there. We, it's just going to, we need to be a little bit patient right now. I also think if you really show them what possibly was the injury, whether it's, you know, show them surgery, poss- you know, what was done surgically and show them what you're protecting and, and really let them know why, why are we having to wait four to six weeks? They really do so much better. Otherwise, they just know they're on crutches. They don't like crutches. <laughs> it's no fun. And yet, if you're telling them this is what we're wanting to heal, and we can't interrupt that healing, or it's going to affect you down the road, and it, it, it might keep you from playing. And I think sometimes it's not necessarily scaring them, but also giving them just a little fear of we, we don't want to um, interrupt what the surgeon did in this injury and or this is what's healing and we need to have this healed. I think they really respond well if you really teach them that. And it's funny because you'd think that it's been explained to them, but sometimes 
I think as clinicians, just kind of walk them through the process and sometimes it's not talked about. Why yeah. are you on crutches for this long? Why are you in a sling? But if you can explain that to them, it seems like they, they'll calm down a little bit of like, okay, that makes sense. That's why we're doing this. This is, you know, this is the process. Right. So it sounds like it's almost, you know, because I'm sure you get used to treating similar injuries so many times that it would almost be easy, I could imagine, to take for granted what an athlete should know, or it's like, well, of course you need to be on crutches, but you're saying that really just again, kind of giving them that information and education about, well, here's why it's important and here's what's happening in terms of tissue um, recovery or, you know, if, if you try to accelerate this process beyond the normal healing time, that it may have detrimental impact. Um, as you say, not necessarily scare them, but just to kind of give them you know, clear information and understanding about what's happening. Um, right. Yeah, you mentioned a lot of uh, great points, Lori. And I uh, just one uh, thought that came to mind was that issue of time. And I wonder if one of the challenges for when athletes go from, you know, being in their normal routines where they're, it's probably quite structured, and you said to this, sort of period where they're wondering, well, how am I going to, what am I going to do with all this time? If there's benefit to having some of that same sort of structure, or I don't know if you want to call it regimentation, um, to, to their day, I guess, when they're injured. Is, is there value, would you say, to that? I would, because I, that, that's probably one of the challenges is, is they've just been having this regular routine of, you know, practice weights, you know, probably games if they're in the middle of season and, and now all of a sudden that's taken away. And I think even on top of that, a lot of times if their team is traveling, all of a sudden they're not even traveling with them. They're sitting at home sometimes by themselves because the, you know, their roommates are gone because they're a part of the team. And, um, it, it's interesting because I think we've had a lot of grades slip during their injury mm -hmm. and you would think they have more time, you know, but I think there's just, they don't have that regimen that they're used to. And, and I think that is hard. And I, gosh, I've, I've also seen that, you know, when they're not practicing and they're not used to their regular schedule, they don't sleep as well. I, we've definitely seen where they have trouble sleeping. I think sometimes it's a pain related, you know, a difficulty to sleep but I think sometimes it's just their body's used to working out they're used to you know pushing themselves hard and and doing that regimen that they're used to and I I do think that that is such a big challenge for them and if you can help create some of that I don't think you can recreate it completely but if you can give them some ideas of what they can be doing on their time um, on this kind of new time, I feel like. And I think too, that sometimes the kids just, they don't want to go sit at practice because that doesn't, that's not fun for them. And, and sometimes they retreat altogether if they're not being made to go to practice. And I don't think that's a very good, um, way to go about it. Cause I think they lose touch with their, their teammates and their coach, but it is, but sometimes it's really hard for them to just be sitting at practice for three hours and, and then um, still have to do rehab and, and different things. And so a lot of times when we're trying to figure out their schedule, I, I can you know, talk with coaches. That's a, again, a communication thing where you can talk to, a lot of times the, the coaches, they don't want them at practice all the time, but they want them at practice for maybe just a little portion of it. Mm -hmm. And then we can use a portion of that practice for rehab. And then we can use maybe a portion of it as for the strength coach or for them to do a little bit extra on their own, or maybe that's, they can spend a little bit of time in film, but if you can help them kind of fill their day a little bit and, and give them kind of a new structure. And I really think it's, it's helpful, but I think they're really lost in that time. Cause they, mm -hmm. and they, a lot of times if the coaches aren't telling them where to be, or maybe they just don't have to be there and it's a little bit of a choice. I think it's helpful to tell them that it's, it's, you know, it's helpful to be at practice a little bit. It's helpful to keep it with your friends. 
I know it's hard emotionally, but it's harder emotionally, I think, to not be connected. Right. And, and maybe on those days that they're not being able to travel, hey, let's bump up rehab a little bit, or maybe you can focus on this while they're out of town. I think it really helps them uh, be able to just figure out what, what they need to be doing with their days during this time. Yeah. And again, that point you mentioned just about um, directing their attention to things that they can be doing, right? Or different facets of their, their performance that, you know, maybe if their shoulder is in a sling, which you mentioned that there's still other, you know, of course, their lower body strength that may be important or watching film sort of tactical elements all, all the different kind of pieces of the puzzle that go into performance that they could still be working on and uh, it sounds like you spend some time trying to direct their focus or, or encourage them to engage in those things um, yeah uh, that sounds great you mentioned pain and maybe you can talk a little bit about the physical and or psychological aspects of pain and injury right um obviously you just have that especially right after injury just that acute pain and and a lot of times that first week or two is just you know really overwhelming i think the pain is, can be overwhelming to the athlete and how to to deal with it that again kind of depends on what kind of team you have around you of of helping with that process i think if you have a good team you're you're getting taken care of and 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 icing and you know teaching them what they need to do to control that pain can be initiated right away those that that don't have that team and and maybe are just dealing with at home trying to you know the parents are trying to figure out how to take care of them sometimes that's a lot harder and i think it can be really stressful um, it's also at the time where there's a lot of unknown, you don't know, you know, what, what the pain is, is, a, you know, really caused from and, and there can be a lot of stress of what to do with it and how to manage it. I do think that's where physical therapy comes in and, and we can be that really teach them how to, to manage that pain, but it can be really wearing. I think pain in general, physical pain can be really wearing on you, takes your sleep away. You can't, you know, just walking on crutches is so difficult and just learning how to do, you know, all the different things that you have to do to manage the pain. There's a lot of education that needs to be done there. And, and sometimes it's done quick, quickly. And, and yet sometimes I think athletes, it takes them a few weeks to get that information, you know, to them of how they can manage that pain. And, and, and I think an athlete, you know, they deal with a lot of pain in general, just being an athlete. And sometimes it's educating them on what's, what's an okay pain, what's a not okay pain, what, you know, what do you need to, to, to push through. And I think that's a lot of what we have to do is kind of teach them what pain is okay to, to push through. But sometimes we're teaching them, you know, what's not a pain to push through and, and where you need to be smart and, and not push through it. And, and so I feel like that's a definitely a challenge as, as far as the athlete aspect of it because they're they're emotionally um you know stressed about the injury but they're also they're truly in physical pain and and it, sometimes it takes some time to really calm that down yeah um as far as the psychological pain i i think it's just that emotional you know whether it's an anxiety or just the the fear and it is a pain. Like, I feel like it's a little bit of a grief, you know, that they're dealing with and, and it's, it's hard to kind of wrap around. I think what they don't even know what they're feeling, <laughs> you know, and I, yeah. and you definitely see, especially at the beginning, just a lot of, a lot of tears, I think a lot of frustration, some anger and, and whether that's a psychological pain or, or what that is. But I think there's, there's definitely a lot of emotions that, and a lot of it is just the unknown. And, and, and on top of that, you have physical pain. It's just, it's just so emotional. Yeah. Especially that first week or two, I feel like it's just so hard because you know, you can, you're going to get them through this, but that, that first few weeks is just so difficult. Whether it's just mm -hmm. right after injury or after surgery, um, it, it's overwhelming. I think, yeah. I think it's just overwhelming for them both and, on both ends, physically and emotionally. You know? Yeah. And, and 
emotionally, do those emotions change over the course of recovery? Yeah, I I do. I as far as thinking to that, I feel like it's a, a roller coaster. I, I at least like watching. You know, I feel like that there's not this exact pattern that I see the kids go through. I I know they've talked about how the athlete goes through a little bit of the grief grieving process and and I really really believe that there's a little bit of that you know you see them uh, you know a little bit at the beginning I think they're just a, a little bit in shock they're in a little denial and and maybe don't quite know what's a, a you know up ahead for them mm -hmm. and then I think once they start to see the process or and or they get the exact diagnosis and what there's going on there's you know, just a lot of sadness. I, I think you see a lot of tears, anger. I think you, you definitely see the anger. And, um, and I, and I feel like it, it just, you know, is going up and down for them and kind of day to day. I think the first few weeks are just a lot, a lot of emotions. I think then once you get kind of some answers, maybe the process kind of put out for them and, and they see what they're up against, I, I feel like you see a little bit of calmness but, and, and maybe at least from that initial um, sadness of it. But I, I, I do think, especially if you take an ACL where it's, you know, an eight to nine month process, I think they have some really, you know, good days. I think we have some really bad days. I feel like I'm having to constantly kind of manage what day they're having, maybe what kind of week they're having. Uh, sometimes I, when we've, we've set some little goals and, you know, they're getting off crutches, they have a happy day, they're getting off crutches, but, but then they start walking for a few days and it's really, really sore and it's really, you know, stiff and it's not feeling great. And all that high of getting off crutches has just gone down to a lot more frustration or you, you know, the day that we get to start them running, I see, you know, a little bit of a high and some excitement, but then it's a little frustrated that they can tell how out of shape they are and how much process they have still to get to to on the field and so I, I just feel like you see so many highs and lows mm -hmm. and I think it's normal I think it's hard not to go through that but um, but I know as a clinician it's it's hard to on those on those good days it's fun it's fun to kind of get them you know moving ahead and, and having them see that positiveness and yet you've got to kind of have, help them grind through those, those low days as well. And mm -hmm. I always tell them too, as an athlete, like if you're okay with this process and you're not a normal athlete, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, cause this is, uh, this isn't supposed to be where you want to be and it's not supposed to be fun. And, and yet it, it's still hard to watch them through it. Cause I think most, most people would look back and it's probably going to be one of their harder times that they had to go through. And, yeah. and, and you can't really take that frustration. I think frustration is probably the word that I use the most for an athlete going through injury. It's just, right. they're a hundred percent frustrated with the whole process, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it sounds like the, you mentioned the highs and lows in terms of their emotions. Would you say, or it sounded like the highs are tied to uh, moments of attainment but the right. lows then are maybe associated with realizations that they're not where they want to be. There's still a lot more progress to be made. Um, is that an accurate characterization? Yeah. I mean, I feel like those are just definitely significant times. I think sometimes, um, you know, some emotions come where maybe maybe the team's traveling this weekend and you didn't get to go and, yeah. and you're really, you know, all of a sudden just really hit you that, that you didn't get to go to this game or, or maybe on those days that, you know, they, they find out that there's just not a chance to get back this season and, and they've really lost the, the whole season. I feel like there's a, a lot of different days that kind of bring on some more emotion as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I think sometimes they're just, they're having, you know, a bad day and just emotionally is just, you know, is, is harder than it was the other day or today. They just can't seem to, you know, put the smile on their face that they could the other day. And, um, and I, yeah, I feel like, again, it's, it's kind of like on that initial where there's just so much emotion. I feel like it kind of 
it spreads out through that whole process as well of just so many little things are coming their way that are hitting them that that are that are harder than and and that they just didn't expect you know yeah you know. what what are some things Lori, that the athletes can do to manage some of those negative thoughts and emotions or just the intensity of it which it sounds like you're alluding to right that's a good question because that's what I want to be taught so that I can help teach them a little bit more. <laughs> but um, I, it seems like if they can, can talk to others that have been through the process, I feel like I've seen that um, be really helpful. Um, sometimes in a joking manner of like, yeah, that, that was my stage that I hated too. Or, you know, and I love, I love in my facility where I'll have, you know, maybe eight kids doing rehab and and them starting to chit chat with each other i feel like they can help each other so much more than i can sometimes because uh it's someone going through what they're going through and i i have seen that be really really helpful uh talking to someone that really understands them and maybe that is either going through it or just went through it i i've seen that really be helpful i i think being told that that their emotions are okay. I think they need to understand that it is okay to be mad. It's okay to be frustrated. I think sometimes they fight it so badly because it's, um, you know, not the right thing. And I, I especially the athlete, they try to be so tough mm -hmm. and, and I think they try to really take it on themselves. A lot of them do. And, and I think sometimes they need to be told it's okay to me. Maybe you need, to talk to someone about this, even if it's just the sports psychologist, maybe it's just talking to a friend. Um, I think sometimes they try to do it so much on their own and right. just understanding that this is a difficult time and it should be emotional and, and it's okay to cry and it's okay to be mad. And sometimes I think they just need to hear that and it, maybe it helps. Um, but I, I would love to, to know how to help them more through it. Cause I, I think it's, it's real. I think it's a, a really hard process to, um, to be in. And, and, and yet I don't know if we can take it away completely for them. I think we can sure. only make it a little bit smoother, but anything out there that, that me as a clinician could be giving them or teaching them or, um, would be so helpful, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and, and maybe it's still learning what, what is the best thing to, to sure. help them out. And everybody's a little bit different. I think every athlete's just a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's a, that to me is a good question. <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, and I think, you know, uh, you mentioned a number of, uh, things that, that seem to be important or certainly there's some evidence to support the value of in terms of legitimizing the, those feelings um, and I guess normalizing the fact that it's um, a frustrating experience and it's perfectly understandable that one would have those those feelings and as you say sometimes maybe having the athlete reach out to other individuals who've had similar experiences and and being able to share that can um, alleviate maybe some of the intensity or you mentioned a lot of apprehension and anxiety and and, you know, I guess if there's an athlete someone respects who's come through the challenge of injury successfully, then, you know, sort of that belief of, well, if they did it, so can I, kind of that, those right. efficacy beliefs. Right. Um, but also, I, I suppose in the sports psychology or in psychology more broadly, and, and I suppose kind of as a wider phenomenon, more people are familiar with this concept of mindfulness and simply kind of being aware that these are thoughts that one's having and um and that's like they're, they're they're just thoughts they'll pass um and um sort of realizing also at a certain point that those thoughts um having maybe the athlete articulate how their thoughts are impacting their emotions and you know in sports psychology again we kind of distinguish between thoughts and emotions or feelings. So the thought like, well, this happened to me at the very worst time possible then leads to the emotion of frustration or, you know, if that, you know, person had been watching where they were going, I wouldn't have had this collision. And, and then that leads to anger or frustration or maybe it's right, directed right. to the self. 
and so sort of being able to connect how those thoughts and emotions may impact behaviors and it might even be conversations with the athlete like oh well how do you feel like those emotions you're experiencing are are they impacting your your effort or you know your engagement in the rehabilitation or um you know do you feel like it's having some behavioral consequence and sometimes even being able to tease those things out uh seems to be helpful for the athlete but i think you're right like to a certain extent, there's only so much one can do. And and if you weren't frustrated or if it weren't, um, you know, something that created some anger, then you would wonder if the person really, you know, cared about their sport involvement. So I think right. you're on the mark that there's only so much one can take away given the nature of the experience. Right, um, right. And and also, I guess one other thought. Now I feel like you got me going here, Larissa. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, just sort of the idea of that f- those negative emotions don't have to be maladaptive or are always harmful or or unhelpful. But you know, maybe there are times where an athlete performed well when they were pissed off or angry about something, and they kind of right. use that. And I think that can also be part of the athlete mindset of channeling that frustration and sort of using it as fuel for the fire, so to speak. Um, But yeah, I think that's a whole probably discussion unto itself. Uh, um, But in in terms of uh, pain management, I was going to ask, aside from pharmacological treatments or prescribing medication, are there things that you do to help athletes manage their pain uh, and I guess we've been talking more about sort of pain in the psychological sense but in the physical more physical yeah um I mean we try to do quite a bit of modalities um definitely icing and doing the game ready I feel like um is huge of just getting some that ice and compression uh, a lot of, uh, I do a lot of hands-on. I like to get my hands in there and just doing a lot of massage. I feel like there is some component of healing with that as well as just, uh, it seems like it, the athletes really like that as far as reducing pain. Um, and, and I think it always helps me to just see, is there more swelling in there, more scar tissue? Is there something that we can be working on? Um, some of it is just teaching them what they can be doing on their own as well. And sometimes that's a challenge with an athlete of having them do stuff on their own. But the more that they can uh, grasp onto that, the more that they can control their pain and whether it's icing regularly, uh, is it stretching regularly, uh, trying to really educate the patient of like when your knee is really stiff and sore, these are the exercises that you can be doing to um, help that and I think uh, again it's it's kind of showing them what by us doing this it it will calm down the pain and and teaching them what is in their control of you know that Um, and it's probably the the main things I think some of it is really monitoring their activity Uh, that's easier said than done that's for sure but sometimes we're overdoing it and pushing them too hard I've definitely had you know times where the kid just wants to come in all five days and they don't want to miss a day and I let that happen for a little while until the pain they start to have some sore days and and then I tell them that this is you know now it's showing that you need a day off and and really teaching them the importance of a day off or maybe a lighter day. Sometimes um, they just think more is is better. And and Mm -hmm. through rehab, that is uh, sometimes the case and sometimes not. So it's it's really teaching them that concept. And and that's hard. That's kind of a day-to-day process, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And even for me, it's a process of you're constantly trying to push them and push them into um, progression. And yet, that can easily cause too much pain, too much swelling and, and have to back off. And just that management of 
that's probably to me the hardest part of our job is just actually managing that um, day to day and and just keeping that pain down and and sometimes it's figuring out what works for each kid is it icing is it this and and trying to teach them that as well so I think it's it's half us just using what we have available to to help that um, help reduce pain but it's also you know figuring out what works for each kid as well yeah and you know I guess given the kind of athlete mindset of of wanting to progress and and maybe sometimes push the limits and and combining that with their desire to get back it sounds like part of your challenge as a physical therapist is to help them do that so they can progress but um, also again you know maybe to encourage recovery or um, you know to at, at times they've maybe gone past the point where they should to kind of talk about that and use that it sounds like as a way to say hey maybe we need to back off a bit is that right right yeah and that that's those are the days that i usually see a lot of frustration is you know they've pushed it real hard and they've had a good few days but now it's hurting so bad that they you know they feel like they can't do what they need to do and they can't push it again and that's where you know you're just really talking them through that it doesn't mean you know, just because you have to take a day off doesn't mean you're not going forward. And I think that's, that's such a hard thing to teach them. Um, and, and once they, they can grasp that, which I feel like it, sometimes they never do in a sense, but mm. when, when they can see that just because they have a sore day and they've pushed it a little bit and the knee is sore, doesn't mean that they, they aren't going forward. But I feel like you're, you're kind of doing this, you know, forward and back, forward and back as far as, um, how the knee is feeling and how they feel like they're progressing and especially that time right before they're really getting back into sport I, they feel like they're so close and yet they they still have this um, time of just really being you know sport ready i i think we have a lot of uh, kind of up and down days in that challenge as far as pain and because yeah. you're trying to push it you're trying and and I even I'm trying to push it but sometimes we have to just really listen to to their pain and back off a day or you know going back and forth and that that is a really frustrating time for them because sure. they're just ready to go <laughs> they yeah. just want to yeah. go they don't want to take a day off they don't want to deal with pain they don't want to deal with managing the pain because it's not the fun part they'd much rather be out doing what they want to do but you almost can't get through the process if you don't kind of figure that that out as far mm -hmm. as taking days off and maybe you have to ice it a little bit more in that time frame and, and yeah that, that's a hard time i think for them yeah and earlier you had mentioned you know there's times where there's education about okay well if we push too much that there may be detrimental consequences or it may have adverse effects and you know, like slow you down more than anything. So um, it, it sounds like there's also for whatever kind of interest there is in moving forward with the progression, it sounds like there's also a need to, um, yeah, balance that with, with rest and recovery. Right, um, right. And it's, that's just not the fun part for yeah. an athlete. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah. You you mentioned sleep earlier, Lori, and and maybe you can talk a little bit about sleep and its importance for recovery for the injured athlete. And and I know again right. you said pain may impact sleep. Right. I think I mean anytime you had a lack of sleep, um, for one, it can just affect your ability to go through your your workouts like you want. Um, I think it affects your emotions as well. And uh, I think that uh, obviously sleep in itself is where our body recovers and, and, and we, we definitely need it. And so um, I don't know the specifics. I'm sure there's lots of research out there of, of the specifics of it, but there's no doubt our body does a lot of recovery during sleep. And, and yet if you're either not taking care of yourself during that time, and or if just whether it's pain or anxiety is keeping you from sleeping or just the combination of it all i i can really tell you know kids come in and they're just like oh i'm exhausted i'm just not 
you know, feeling good today. And, and it really affects how we are able to work out that day. And, you know, one day here and there is, is normal and is a, is a normal part. But I think sometimes I have kids that really get in kind of a bad cycle and, and definitely you can start to see that it's, it's truly affecting them, whether it's both emotionally or physically. And, um, sometimes we'll have them even talk to our team doc if it's really just becoming an issue. And, and sometimes they, it seems like they can get them back on kind of a sleep cycle if they're, they've kind of kicked out of it. But there's no doubt our, our body needs it. Um, you know, it's, it's a type of uh, healing. And, and if you're lacking it, there's so many consequences. And, and I also think it just kind of keeps, rises their anxiety a little bit as well if they're just trying to go to bed and not being able to sleep and, or if they're not taking care of themselves, it's kind of the same thing. But. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, again, uh, you had mentioned you just sort of for anyone, of course, injured or not, the sleep is so important for our recovery and, and emotions. And, and, um, and also I thought it was interesting that previously you talked about part of what aids athletes in their sleep is the fact that normally they're training pretty vigorously. And so maybe they're more tired at the end of the day, whereas particularly when they're initially injured, they maybe just can't be as physically active as normal. And so that may also impair sleep. I think you were suggesting. Right. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's uh, a lot of them complain about that. Just like, mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm so used to being so tired when I go to bed and I just, they don't have that, um, you know, just exhaustion, yeah. <laughs> ready to go to bed. Right. right. Yeah. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the, or athlete expectations and what role their expectations play in, in terms of recovery. Right. Um, as far as like that, I feel like their very first expectation of the athlete is just, you know, when am I going to get back to play? <laughs> like, I feel like that's the very first question that either they are asking or parents are asking or anyone around them is, is asking is just that expectation of, you know, wanting to know when, when am I going to get back to play? That's just their very first question. And, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that's difficult to answer because I, I, I don't think a lot of times we don't know right away and yet it's, you know, they're already looking ahead of like, well, what can I play here? Can I play this? Or, you know, what they're just looking ahead. And I think they have this expectation of being told. Um, and I feel like that's such a hard aspect of injury. Just the people really want a time frame. I mean, it's the very first question that people ask right off the bat and it's usually asking the doctor and, um, sometimes the doctor will kind of whip out a time frame, and I feel like we have all these time frames medically, but you know they'll they'll say you know six to eight months, and that the kid's expectation is six, and I'm going to beat it and be ready by five. <laughs> you know, yeah. so they they have an expectation of kind of beating that time frame, and um, I I think that's where education really comes in of just really teaching them what those timelines are, but. Um, so they have an expectation of kind of beating the process, I think. And sometimes that is wonderful. And, and then sometimes we do it and sometimes it's a hindrance as well. Yeah. Um, I do think, uh, I, I guess I feel like they have an expectation of, of us as clinicians of just being taken care of and cared for and, and same thing of their coaches. I think they have an expectation of their coach and sometimes, um, I don't think coaches mean to, but I think sometimes they're in, in the middle of the season and someone's hurt and they kind of push them off to the, um, you know, the medical staff and, and they don't realize how important their opinion is to the, to the athlete. And um, I, I see a lot of frustration with athletes there, just their, the co you know, what they expect of their coach. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes they're disappointed. And I, and I, I, I think if you ever approach a coach, they're never meaning to, they're just, they got a lot on their mind and, and yeah. they just, they don't realize the kids that, you know, opinion of them is, is so important. And so, yeah. so I feel like they, they have expectations that way that sometimes, um, are, are maybe unrealistic or, or sometimes they're not being taken care of as well. Right. right. Um, 
does that present challenges for you and your role if their expectations, uh, even of, of the coach or maybe it's directed to you or as you mentioned, the time frame and, and they're not meeting the time frame, does that make your work difficult? Um, yes, I feel like it always is a little bit of a stressor for me because again, you can see the stress on them and, and you try to see if you can maybe fix it. Maybe it's trying to take it on as your, yourself as a clinician of trying to, to meet that time frame or meet their expectations. I think I've learned over the years to, to acknowledge when their expectations are unrealistic and help them kind of rethink through their expectations. I feel like I've had to learn as a clinician to not take on all that. Um, but, um, but, but I also feel like I want to hear their expectations because, um, sometimes you can help them meet it, you know, and I, I think sometimes it's a challenge for you as well to, to kind of meet that. It's always interesting of, you know, where they're at, in, you know, I feel like every athlete is just a little bit different. Where is it at in their season or in their years? Are they a senior? Do we have the ability to get them back for a certain game? You know, there's all, you're always playing that game of, and I have learned that if I, if I can get out of them right away, of like, you know, what's next? What, is, what are you thinking? What is your next, what is the next game? What's the next um, thing that you're wanting to be at? Or what's the next season? And, um, I feel like the more I learn that and you, you hear their expectations, you can hopefully either help them be like, Hey, we're, we're going to try to reach that, but I don't, you know, maybe give them a realistic of, you know, this expectation is just, it's not possible, but, but let's look at the next one. What's the next one. And, and trying right. to help them through that. Um, I think it helps me see where they're coming from and just, and what, what I need to be helping them with. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes you have to kind of, uh, you know, kind of steer them into more realistic expectations as well. Right, right. And sometimes it's, you know, maybe it's trying to create that communication. Maybe it's touching base with a coach. Sometimes when I hear that uh, an athlete's, you know, maybe stressed coach, I just don't think coach cares about me anymore. I don't think they, you know, um, they just don't even talk to me. They don't even ask me how things are going. A lot of times I'll take that and I, you know, if you can just have a quick conversation with the coach and just be like, hey, and not not let them know that, but more right. of like, you know, hey, this this athlete was kind of um, wor worrying about this. Um, is there something that they could be doing for that? And then the next thing you know, the coach is having that conversation with them. And you're creating, yeah. you know, you're creating that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of times you'll find out, you know, the coach is just busy. Um, sometimes they don't realize that they can actually have, um, you know, an impact of how that, that athlete is feeling. Sure. Um, but I think sometimes you can help create that a little bit. And sometimes I, I think they're, you know, the athlete's expectations are, are, are just more wrapped around them as well. Sometimes it, yeah, you, sure. you know, it's a little bit, um, just, you know, thinking, not thinking outside the box, I guess, a little bit. Yeah. Or I guess maybe very self-focused. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> but um, yeah, and your point about coaches sometimes maybe just uh, being busy and occupied with all the many tasks that they're assuming. And, and um, if, if they're not reaching out to the athlete, it, it may be because they're preoccupied, but sometimes the athlete isn't necessarily thinking along those lines. Right, um, right. But also that there's some benefit, it sounds like, even just to simple moments where the coach does reach out to the athlete and um, uh, Yeah, I think even just a how are you doing, how's rehab yeah. doing can go a long yeah. way, you know. Right. I, right. I really think that. And it's just more of just like, hey, I'm still thinking about you. You're still a yeah. part of my team. And um, and I think that you can see that with um, older coaches. I think they learn that. I, mm -hmm. I think sometimes there's some growth there that they just, they acknowledge that they can keep that, that athlete engaged some way that it actually benefits them after. And, and I think sometimes we can teach them that too, of like, even just, you know, just asking them, can they, and, and maybe learning from yourself of like, what does that coach think that they can be doing? And that in itself opens up a door for the coach to acknowledge that, you know, they, this, this athlete can be doing some other things during, you know, whether it's during practice or, or, 
or otherwise. And some coaches really take that on well. And sometimes I think they just um, need to learn that that can be a little bit in their role. You know? Yeah, right. Well, your, your comments are certainly consistent with many athletes I've spoken to who indicate that sometimes just a short text, how's it going, or you know, just checking in periodically in whatever way can, can really be beneficial for the athlete mindset. Yeah. Um, what, what are some, and you've talked already about this, but what are some specific types of support that athletes need or that they benefit from in their rehabilitation? Right. Um, obviously, just a good medical staff around them. Um, and the more that they can have, the better. And, and sometimes that's not always an option, but, but just even uh, as people that they trust, whether it's the doctor or the physical therapist, uh, just really caring. I think a sports medicine team that just really acknowledges the, the athlete, I think that, um, you know, just understanding the stress of missing practice, missing a game, missing, you know, missing, you know, that just goes such a long way if they, they know that the medical staff around them um, really cares about them as an athlete and, and yeah. that, that it's important. Uh, I, I think socially they just need, um, whether it's, they need just a good group around them and whether that's family whether that's friends whether that's coaches um it's it is impressive to see the people around them just really step up um and i and i think a lot of people have that you know support around them and and yet some really don't like i um you know we i we have an international you know group of athletes here and and that when they're when they're hurt and they're so far away from home and and they don't have that family um and at least the closeness it's you know sometimes they have coaches around them just you know or or roommates or that just really step up um but sometimes they don't you know and a lot of them are on their on their own and that's where I think I feel that the medical staff is sometimes the the only people they they get around them Mm -hmm. Um, but it sure seems like the, you know, the kids that just have a, a, a big support group around them emotionally, you know, physically, that type of thing is just, is just huge. Mm -hmm. I do think, um, gosh, if you can have the, the sports psychologists around and, and a part of it, it can just be huge, um, and, and just so helpful. That's for sure. Um, I feel like that's, for the athletes that it's lucky like to have, to have that around them already. Um, but I sure think that that can be just a huge component of it. And so, yeah, just a good group around them, um, that will let them cry, let them get mad, you know, take them back and forth to rehab where if they need yeah. rides cause they're on crutches. And, yeah. um, I, I just think that the more they have around them, the, the better the process is that's for sure and would you say you mentioned differences where some athletes seem to have an abundance of support and maybe particularly for athletes that are far away from home or overseas maybe lacking in support do you see differences in terms of outcomes uh, behaviorally or functional outcomes in terms of their rehabilitation when you compare those two I would say yes. Um, I guess again, you know, it depends on the the kid or the athlete. I think some are, you know, just really tough and they can, um, and and they can do it on their own. I think, I think the ones that have, you know, the extra support, just it goes a little smoother. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think they they just don't feel so alone in yeah. in the process. Right. Um, I guess I can't say if it, you know, affects their outcome or not, but I, I would have to say it does, you know, it yeah, just, I mean, it just, even if it's just a little bit smoother, yeah. um, and, and just felt more cared for, I've definitely seen where, um, you know, you have either some, I don't, I don't know what you would call them, but just parents that maybe are maybe aren't giving them the support of just being out there very maybe they're very pushy trying to push them back into sport trying to drive them a little bit more less supportive and more you know kind of pushy in a sense and 
you can see the stress in, in those kids that they don't feel as supported. Maybe same thing with coaches. If the coaches are, um, you know, a little bit more pushy and, and trying to push the, the timelines and just, you know, giving them a lot of anxiety of trying to get back and, and not supporting them as much. I feel like you see a rise in anxiety as well. So, um, I definitely think if they don't have, if they're not getting good support and, and kind of bad support, um, you can definitely see the effects of that. Right, That's right. Bad. So it, there may be pressures on athletes at times from external sources to, to get back and, and compete. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. You definitely, um, you know, you definitely can see that. And sometimes it's their, their own uh, maybe interpretation of it. Um, but but I feel like I think there is pressure and sometimes it's their own pressure, but I think sometimes it's the pressure with people around them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe those high end athletes, it's a little bit of the media and this, the, you know, just the, that, those times of pressures of getting back in, they've got to feel that, you know? Mm -hmm. So would you say that athletes have different motivations or reasons for returning? Um, yes. Yeah, definitely. I think sometimes it's, you know, their own motivation and they're wanting to get back for them. But I think there's, there's always that parental pressure that can be present. Um, coach, you know, pressure, that's for sure. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I definitely feel like sometimes it's not their, their own. Mm -hmm. And I, I have definitely seen, you know, in the process, process of injury, the athlete really find out that they maybe don't love the sport as much. And they, they yeah. do realize that maybe this isn't something they really want to work for and, and get back and, and have the stress of wanting to quit and not wanting to get back in. And yet having, you know, not being able to tell a parent, not being able to tell a coach that yeah. they really don't want to get back in. And I feel like that is, that's a very stressful situation. And yet it, it happens, you know, especially, those kids that are on their second, third injury and they're, they're just tired of kind of rehabbing and, and working through this. And, yeah. and maybe it is time to call it quits. And those are really emotional times, I think. And, and I think the kids that have good support around them and they can make that decision easier. Uh, I've seen a, a lot of really high stress situations where, you know, literally fearful to tell their parents that they just don't want to get back. And, and I've had, parents call me and try to tell me to talk their kid into playing and mm -hmm. and being able to tell them you know that this is their decision I, I really think they're making a good decision at this point and it's so it's interesting how the the pressures around the athlete can be in in that process that's for yeah. sure yeah I I don't think I've heard that specific uh experience before where, where parents are calling the physical therapist, asking them to convince the athlete <laughs> to return. But I'm sure you've experienced the full gamut of, you know, involvement from different parties uh, in, in the recovery uh, process. Right. Um, maybe you can talk, um, and I, I asked already, I guess, about kind of motives for returning and different reasons. Um, but maybe you can talk about the role of motivation in, and its importance in athlete recovery. Right. You definitely see the, the, the kid that's just really motivated and wanting to get back on, onto the field or the court is, you know, they're constantly asking what they can do. They're constantly asking, um, can I do more? Uh, they're very um, compliant with therapy. They're very compliant with, um, you know, showing up, doing what I ask of them. Um, and, and yet you see, I, and, and I think sometimes it's a personality thing, but I, the kid that just is so desiring to get back to play, you can see it in them as far as just, what can I do? What else can I do? Can I do this? Can I do that? You know, when can I, you know, they they got a ton of questions and those are the kids that for me, you can already tell the process is, is going to go well because they're going to, they're going to go through the, you know, what they need to do. They're going to do a little bit more than, um, you know, asked of and, and just really keep, you know, pushing towards it. And, you know, you always wonder what is that internal drive? What is the motivator? Just the love of the, the sport, the love of, 
you know, what, what, what causes you to love sport? And there's so many different reasons for it, but, um, you can usually see that right off the bat of just, you know, that kid that is pretty motivated. I think even that kid that is the most motivated, I think there's always a time in their rehab that you can kind of see they're losing it and, and maybe it's just wearing on them going, you know, being that going through the process, just, I think injury can really wear on you and, and trying to be upbeat and be motivated. But I, I do feel like that kid that, it has that picture of them of getting back to play it definitely is the one that's you know more compliant with rehab more compliant with you know doing the extra things that they need to do and and can really come through the process um really well and there's you you can sometimes see the kids that you know may maybe they're maybe they're not a player maybe they're a bench player and they've gotten hurt they're not as motivated to get back playing. They don't have a time frame in their mind. They don't have a goal. Um, you know, maybe they're wavering of, of do they want to get back to play? And and sometimes you can see that in their rehab, their compliance in their rehab. Um, and it can really affect, it can really affect the, the outcome. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times when I'm starting to sense that, uh, I feel like I have to sit them down and just really talk to them of like, you know, you're missing therapy here and there that that's really going to affect us down, down the road. And, um, and, and maybe talk to them about their, you know, what are they motivated for? What, it, what do they want to reach? Um, you know, what, what, what do they see themselves, you know, um, in the future playing, do they want to play? And, and sometimes you have to have those hard conversations. Do, do you want to get back? Um, and maybe you're switching gears and talking them through of, of how to, to quit, <laughs> how to, how to be done. And, and I think that's a whole nother discussion is, um, there's a, I, I feel like I deal with that a lot of, of injury kind of takes them to that decision of quitting. And, and then, then they have a whole new set of concerns <laughs> mm-hmm. of how to move on and what's right. next. And, and even talking to everyone around them of making that decision. And, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes the injury itself, I guess, takes that, that, away from them as well and and then that that's another conversation but but yeah i you can definitely see that through their actions the motivation of getting back to play and sometimes we'll talk about it you know i'll have kids that are aren't really asking me you know when are they going to get back on the field or what can we do um they're not doing what they're asked of and and sometimes we're having those conversations as uh, clinicians of you know do, do we need to approach them and ask them, is, is this where they want to be doing? We're trying to push them towards this. We can either keep pushing or we can, you know, maybe we need to look at, at not pushing them back in, you know, so there's mm-hmm. sometimes you're having to have that conversation. Right. You've alluded to it already, but I want to ask explicitly, are there factors that distinguish athletes who make a successful return versus, versus those who are unable to do so? Right. I, I think it's that the highly motivated kids, the ones that have kind of a goal in their mind of why they're coming back. Um, the ones that are compliant with therapy. Um, and, and that includes, you know, you know, doing the restrictions that they need to be doing and and resting when they need to be doing and taking care of, you know, the pain and and that type of thing, basically doing what we're asked, uh, you know, asked of, um, I think the kids that are really ask a lot of questions and really um, are inquisitive of what is going on. I think those kids seem to buy. Sometimes, you know, you're constantly ask, answering their questions, but they, they start to buy in to what you're doing because you're explaining why. Um, and I think sometimes that's where like the kids that, that don't ask those questions, we need to be giving them that information anyway. But the kids that are, are constantly kind of pushing you to like, what else can I do? What can I do this? Can I do that? Um, I feel like they're always coming out a little bit more on the other end. I think the, the kids that will go do extra, they'll, they'll, you know, go sit and film more. They'll, they'll go into the weight room and, um, do a little bit of the extra. It seems like, you know, that they're the ones that are just, you see them come out on the other end a little bit better and and probably back to sport you know back to sport a little bit more yeah so it sounds like there's maybe an inquisitiveness 
or certain behavioral things you mentioned, like taking extra steps to go watch film, for example, or, you know, maybe, yeah, kind of behavioral things that are indicative of their, their interest in getting back. And, and you mentioned uh, from your standpoint, sounds like maybe those are the ones who fare better in terms of their outcomes. Right. I sure think so. And I, I think sometimes when we're having to push them to do extra or push, you know, we're, we're even just trying to, you know, be the pusher as far as just even to come to rehab and, and all of that, those, I feel like sometimes it's just, they're going through the emotional stage and you gotta, gotta get them through a tough stage and, and they'll come back around. But, but sometimes those are the ones that I just, uh, you know, they're just the, they're not going to get through the, you know, getting back into shape and getting back into, and even working through the fear of getting back on the field and that, um, I, the kid that seems to kind of push that on their own, it's, it, it sure is a lot easier on my end, but I, yeah. but sometimes I feel like I can't tell the kid enough of what, you know, what they can be doing on their own. It's mm -hmm. got to be their, their push a little bit. Right. And it's what makes them a good athlete. A lot of those athletes are the ones that, you know, that's why they're good. It's because they're doing extra. They're doing more than what the coach asks of them. They're, they, they understand that they're staying in extra and, you know, shooting extra. And that's what makes them who they are. Yeah. The one, the one kid too, that uh, I think does so much better is the one that likes the weight room. <laughs> mm -hmm. The ones that don't seem to like the weight room and conditioning and all that, which some kids that uh, they just don't need it. They, you know, they're so talented. They don't have the need for it as much, but I think rehab is really um, not fun. It's a grind. It's a lot of work. Um, and it seems like the kid that, that loves practice, loves the weight room, loves working hard, does a little bit better in rehab, yeah. where the one that's just would rather just play in the game and, you know, some of them are so talented, they, they get away with that for a while. But all of a sudden it hits them of like, I'm going to have to really work for this. Um, I, I think a lot of them figure it out and they, they yeah. learn how to work through that. But I think it's more of a struggle for them. Yeah. They, um, they just don't enjoy, enjoy it as much as the others. Yeah. So it's interesting. It sounds like kind of the athletes when who sort of when they're not injured, if they're used to, or if they take some appreciation or interest or enjoyment, even in, in the aerobics in the weight room, you mentioned that, um, that may be, they're more likely or more apt to work through the grind or the tedium of the rehabilitation. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Okay. We kind of laugh because we have, you know, ones that are that like rehab so much and the, the negotiators, the ones that don't like <laughs> rehab and they're yeah. constantly negotiating. Do I, are, are you sure I have to do all that? Are you, you know? <laughs> and so, yeah, it's I mean, there's definitely some that just, will tell you they I mean nobody likes rehab but I have yeah. ones that like it a little more than others <laughs> right right yeah. um I just a few other questions and um I you had mentioned the point about return to play on a few occasions and I'm wondering how are those decisions made or how do you know that an athlete is ready to resume competitive activity right I think that that is a hard question because it's just it's not straightforward for, I feel like it's different for every athlete. Um, I feel like we have some standard tests, especially on the rehab end that we um, have established of, and I, and I still think there's, there's lots of different scenarios of, of how people go through the tests, but there's definitely just going through the general rehab process and acknowledging, you know, do they have the physical aspects of, the strength, the, um, that type of, um, explosion, their ability to, you know, um, jump and land and, and, and just basically passing the normal functional tests. I mean, that's just a must that, that needs to be done. And that seems so, um, you know, simple. And, and yet again, when you talk about the kid that is a little bit on its own doing physical therapy um, or, or in that process of progressing from physical therapy to, to sport sometimes isn't getting tested and, and it's, it's not as standard, I guess, and it's not being looked at as much. Um, but, but I feel like physically they just must have a certain amount of strength, a certain amount of function. 
and um, you know, being able to just then start talking about practice and and being able to progress into that. Um, I think it's I think return to play is so deceiving because you know, a lot of times that's where, the, you know, the timeline comes into play and those questions are asked of when am I going to get to return to play? And I feel like that is such a broad um, term in a sense. And yet, you know, when a doctor says, well, it'll be six to eight months and it's like, well, what does return to play mean? Because in the, you know, in the kid's mind, it means at six months I'm playing in a certain game. <laughs> and in the doctor's mind, it means you're starting to re, you know, go back to practice. And I just feel like it's, it's, it's definitely um, a term of like, what does return to play mean? Because a lot mm -hmm. of times in the kid's mind, that means playing in their, a game. Mm -hmm. um, where on a clinician's end, re, you know, return to play means you know, starting to work back into practice. And so I feel like that's so deceiving to be like when, you know, to answer that question, because mm -hmm. it's a process and it's a, it's a, it's a progression. And it, when, you know, when we have kids start to pass like our functional tests and we think they're ready to get back into practice, then it's me talking to the athletic trainer and talking about what are the little bit, you know, that we can start in practice. Maybe it's just jogging on the field. Maybe it's some light drills, you know, no contact and see how they do. And then we'll progress to a little bit more um, aggressive drills. And, and it's, to me, return to play is a good two to three month process. Um, and that's where I think a lot of confusion gets made in there as far as, you know, making that decision. But a lot of times, sometimes the doctors are like, you know, you're ready to return to play and bam, they're, you know, they're jumping into practice. Right. And so I, it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer because yeah. I think it's, it's such a process. Well, and I think your answer and the point you make is such a good one and important one because it sounds like they're, you know, that term return to play maybe there there's issues you're suggesting i think we're implying with using that term because it can lead to inconsistent understanding in terms of its meaning the athlete maybe thinks it's a definitive point in time mm -hmm. and, or that's how they interpret it whereas you're saying well no it's you know maybe that's how they think of it but from a practitioner standpoint it's more about well just because you finish physiotherapy there's still this two or three or whatever, however long period before you're going to be gradually doing things before your first competition. And so I, I think that's a great point because maybe the issue of terminology isn't just a small matter, but really one of significance. And uh, you know maybe there's a need to ensure some greater uh, consistency but also specificity with the terminology that's used um yeah, for yeah, sure because I, I feel like it's it is it's a broad term in my mind yeah and yeah everyone interprets it very very differently as right. far as, um, well, yeah yeah and i think you know even from a research standpoint like in in working on research in this area it's sort of like different terms are used return to sport return to play return to competition return to training like what does it all mean exactly right like we throw out all these terms but what does it refer to and it seems like these terms can be so nebulous or ambiguous which probably isn't helpful certainly from a practical standpoint um yeah i guess um in, in terms of uh, that readiness, and uh, and now I'm just thinking about how I frame the, the, the question here, but um, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned, or, or there's maybe some irony in the fact that you said there is less maybe um, assessment of the athlete's physical progress or, you know, the standardized tests of like endurance, uh, proprioception, whatever it may be during that period when they're maybe transitioning back into more sport specific activities or increasing the intensity of what they're doing to me that seems a bit ironic because for many athletes as you mentioned the whole goal is to get back into competitive activity but it sounds like that's a time frame when maybe there's a little bit less 
testing or assessment. Is that, I don't want to misread what right. you're saying. I think that may, that depends on um, where the athlete is. Like, I feel like that's one thing that I feel like I've really tried to work on up, up there where we're a team um, effort. I think we can, we can not lose them in that process. And every, there's somebody that has an eye on them all along where if they're not in physical therapy anymore, they're with an athletic trainer, they're with their strength coach and, and they're still, and even the coach themselves, they're all, you know, trying to, to see whether it's even just visually how they're moving, how they're looking, how they're tolerating it. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll talk to a coach and they'll be like, you know, they're really still moving pretty hesitant on the field. And if that's the case, then we know they're just not physically ready. And so I feel like if you can have that team approach, you've got a really good, you've got really good eyes in through the whole process. Um, if you take a high school kid that tears their ACL and does physical therapy for, you know, kind of a certain amount of time, and then they'll, they're kind of thrown with maybe some sports performance um, people and and then they're put onto the field with maybe maybe a coach watching them maybe not um, I think you you lose some eyes on them of just you know how are they looking and are they ready um, and so I think it depends I think it depends on just you know what type of athlete they are where they're at um, what type of team they have around them yeah. um, but there's definitely um, in my mind, there's definitely some athletes that just, that is such a critical time. It's a huge critical time of like how, you know, how, how to progress them. And yet a lot of them are, are a little, you know, doing it on their own basically. Right, and, right. and a little bit guessing at the process, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, and I even think when we have a whole team around them, it's still, it's still a hard process. Mm -hmm. um to to know if they're ready and and yet i think if you do kind of step by step and in increments with it mm -hmm. then you then you never jump up too fast and find out that they weren't ready for it if you're doing these increments and you kind of get you know one they get really sore they just weren't moving well or they just didn't tolerate a certain drill or a certain um skill and they didn't go well then you can stay in that stage for a little bit longer until moving to the next and and, and you're playing that game through that whole process. And that's where return to play could be a month. Sometimes it, it will drag on two to three months because because the, they're not quite ready or it's, it's just going to take a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's not necessarily the athlete or the injury. It's maybe their position or their sport or how much, you know, how much they play or I, I don't know. I think every sport is just a little bit different of the demands coming right. back and Right. And yet we do have this, you know, if you look at injury and certain diagnoses, you have these just general timelines of return to play. And um, they're, they're just timelines <laughs> and every right. kid's so different. And so, it, so if you don't have that team looking around them, I feel like it's, it's just, um, they get lost in the midst a little bit of, mm -hmm. and, and, I don't, I don't know how to fix that. I mean, I feel like these kind of discussions can, you know, make us better and maybe make the information out there better. But it, it is, it's to me that return to play is, is such a hard, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard because it, everyone wants a specific time frame. Right. Everybody wants that. And, you know, are they ready? And, and all these questions is like, it's so good, but it's so, it's so broad too, as far yeah. as like us really making these decisions and trying well, to figure out what's best, I guess. Right. And it, to that point about time frame, is, is there value in having a primary focus, maybe less on the time frame? and more on meeting certain criteria before the athlete resumes maybe competitive play. So it's like that first competition, but they need to, you know, show that they can respond, their body responds or adapts to certain criteria or that they can, you know, surpass certain criteria. Right. I definitely think so. And I feel like, you know, I've been in so many conversations with even doctors and just, you know, how to improve this process and 
and we always come to that like it it really does need to be like certain criteria and certain goals and um and and yet we all come back to needing the time frames mm -hmm. at least generally because i think everyone involved needs to understand is this just a four to six week process sure. or is this six to eight months and it's like so we all come back to the time frames and if you i laugh every time i look at you know listen to the media in you know in on you know top athletes and just oh when's their time frame everybody wants to know when are they coming back <laughs> and like yeah love because yeah. i feel like i feel like the they're getting better at at not really putting a time frame on it um, sometimes in the media, I feel like they're, they're backing off and like putting a time on it, but, uh, it, that's where I feel like it's, it's communication is so important, but a lot of times right off the bat, a doctor has already put kind of a time frame on it. Yeah. And then you're kind of backtracking as a physical therapist or as someone involved in like, I know the doc said six to eight months, but that's a, that's kind of a general guideline, but these are, this is the criteria that you're going to have to meet. And then you come back, you know, come back around that. But I guarantee that six to eight months doesn't come out of their head. Yeah, <laughs> they, sure, they have sure. that. They've got it like, locked in, but yeah. it sounds also though, like there's some interplay between the two. And like, you know, you mentioned yeah. you can't sort of, even for the practitioner coming back to the, there's some value. It sounds to having time frames, or certainly the athlete is thinking along those lines. Um, so, and and popular culture, as you mentioned, with the media. So to just do away with the whole notion of time frames, maybe sounds like that's not so helpful. But right, like I don't think it's realistic because I just think it's part of sport. You know, sure, you're always sure. trying to see that. But that's where I feel like you do have to come back around and maybe explain to them why there's why is the time frame kind of made and i think you have to come back and explain to them what does return to play really mean it, it's a process it's not it isn't a date and it isn't um uh and it isn't just uh, you know a, a quick as soon as you get your last doctor's appointment bam you're in a game like i think the sooner you tell them all of that that you do have this criteria to me um, I love the doctors. A lot of doctors these days are starting to say, you know, you can't go, they're not putting a specific date on it. They're maybe giving them a guideline, but they're saying you need to be passed off by your therapist, by your doctor, by, you know, this, that, and they're, they're saying more that way rather than it'll be roughly six to eight months, but then you still need to do this, this, and this, you know, and I think that has become a little bit, um, for me, that seems like it's a little bit better of, a, of kind of managing that. Um, so the kid knows it's, it's not just a date because yeah. they hear six months yeah. <laughs> and they've got it on the calendar and they know what game is the next weekend that they're going to possibly play. You know, they've, sure, they've already sure. figured all that out and yeah. you have to kind of back. And that's where those expectations, I think right off the bat come. And the more that you can, kind of start to talk them down off that like yes that is that is kind of the time frame but this is what i normally see and and this is what we'll want to do and you know a lot of times coming back sooner isn't better i mean we're definitely yeah. learning that right that we don't wanna, you know and you're trying to teach them we don't want to get you back sooner than you are ready because we want you to be an athlete for the next few years you know and so there's a lot of education that way yeah. um but i i feel like right off the bat i'm having to kind of solve that problem because it's even especially if the parents come in and they're like they're just all talking of like you know what we want to do this and what about this and will he be back for that and then you just have to like Phew, like let's let's look at this process and right, right. outline it a little bit more and i think if you do that right off the bat it it can really kind of calm everything down and through the whole process yeah um, but again, sometimes I feel like we don't do a very good job about that. And all of a sudden that six months is coming up and they're like, I don't feel ready. I'm not ready. And it's like, well, you're not really, you know, that's just a guideline. And then they're like, what? You know, the, then you start to see the anxiety of, well, well, the doctor told me six months and I thought I'd be back or, and, and so I feel like you're talking through that again, if you haven't done it at the beginning. Yeah. So to that point about feeling ready, is there some psychological component to readiness? to return and i won't say to play or but uh, right. you know readiness maybe to assume different 
or progressively more challenging or intense tasks? I think so. I, I really, and, and maybe it's just because I'm coming from the physical end of it, but I really think if a kid isn't psychologically feeling ready, a lot of times it's because we don't have them physically ready mm-hmm. or we haven't gone through the process right to get them phys- you know, psychologically ready. And I, I, I'm not saying, I think they all have a little fear of getting back in playing. I think they, um, especially, you know, they have in their back of their mind how they got hurt. There's always that in the back of their mind. Um, and I think that's really important to know how they got hurt um, and to know what their fears are. Um, and, and yet I, I really think they're going to have that slight fear. They're going to have that kind of hesitancy to get back in. Um, but if you, if they've gone through physically the right thing and you've got them prepared, for example, like I feel like, you know, at that stage where we can start to run them, if you haven't gotten back their strength and their single leg squat, if they can't do um, a good kind of step off and catch themselves and their leg isn't strong enough to handle running and you ask them to run and they start to run and it doesn't feel good, then they don't feel, they don't feel ready, right? There's sure. a lot of hesitancy sure. and they're really, sure. you know, they're scared to run and they're scared to put or to jump on it. And if, if you physically haven't gotten them ready to do that, and you ask them to do it and it, it doesn't feel right or it doesn't go well, then, then psychologically they're definitely, you know, not ready. They're feeling not right. ready. Right. If you, you know, if you start, you tell them today, Hey, today we're running, we're going to get you running today. And you know, it's been three months since they've ran and, and they're really kind of scared to do it. And, and you've prepared them and that leg is ready to run and they start to run and they're kind of limping and, and working through it. And um, they realize it feels really good and it's fine. And, you know, by the end of the day, they're like, Oh, I was so scared to do that, but it was fine. It was so ready. Right. And I think that's just the same as, as far as like, if you ask them to start to do some stuff in practice and you haven't gotten them ready, um, you're definitely going to find out that they're not psychologically ready for it, but they're not physically ready for it. I think first, you know, initially. And so I think you have to have them physically ready and that's a challenge. And that's, I think sometimes we lack that just whether it's in that process or just how they're being taken care of. And then all of a sudden you're asking them to, to progress and practice and um, you know, they're hesitant and they're scared and they go to do it and it doesn't feel good then you've kind of proven to them that they're not ready, (laughs) you know, I feel like you can make it more positive or, or negative if if they're not ready, especially if they're doing things that they're not ready for. So I don't know if that's really, I I think there's things that we can do to get them psychologically ready, but I think the biggest part is making sure that they're physically ready so that then when they do it and they're working through that fear a little bit, they realize, Oh, I I can trust this. It's, it can do it's ready. Yeah. Okay, so even uh, you know when they're assuming that they can uh, meet certain physical criteria or engage in, in certain tasks at the necessary level, uh, it's still normal that they may have some worry or a little bit of fear or apprehension in some way. But uh, would I be correct in saying that um, it sounds like once they try and engage or they you know you put them through those exercises or they engage in that which they're worried about that they tend to realize okay well my fears were maybe unfounded or I I didn't need not unfounded but I didn't need to worry about it maybe as much as I was because in actuality I am physically ready and therefore well maybe I'm psychologically ready right I I feel like I don't know. And, and that's where you can come into play of just really, you know, us learning, how, can we get them more psychologically ready? But I think there's a component that they're going to have to work through a little bit. And that, um, you know, I, I think even just, you know, if they got hurt getting tackled and they have to kind of get through their first tackle and be like, Oh, I got, I was fine. You know, I feel like, I don't know if you can get them more ready than having them having to go through it a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but well, I, I, I guess I'd love on to learn more. I feel like I'm coming more from the physical end of it 
Um, but I, I feel like it's fairly normal for them to be scared. Sure. And sometimes I feel like I, I'm scared for them. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm scared to put them back in because it's like, well, are they ready? Like we, you know, we don't totally know. And, and I think, you know, sport is risky. That's the sad yeah. thing is we can't, we can't really tell them that they're not going to get hurt. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we have them ready for their injury, but obviously sport is risky and there's, there's a, there's a chance of getting hurt. Unfortunately, that's part of sport. And yeah. so sometimes I feel like that's hard. We can't totally get them ready because I can't promise them they're not going to get hurt, but, but hopefully they're, they're, you know, they're me that we're working on is, is ready or their shoulder or whatever that we've gotten them right before we put them, mm-hmm. before we put them out there. Yeah. And I mean, certainly some of the, these points that we're talking about with respect to their, the physical and the psychological and whether they coincide or, you know, one supports the other. Um, from a research standpoint, those are definitely some questions that I'm interested in. And, you know, for example, well, it probably seems pretty legitimate that you would have some degree of, of worry or concern about putting yourself into a situation that you got hurt in previously, but doesn't matter right? Or it doesn't matter in terms of your risk of re-injury or your performance in some way or some outcome that's of relevance to the athlete, to those who've spent all this time and energy invested in their rehabilitation. And, and I think, you know, it would be good to get some more answers to some of those questions because I think right. that can then help guide decision making. And it's like, well, there, there certainly are some uh, psychological assessments, and we've had s- uh, some conversation about what some of those tools might be to gauge whether the athlete is confident in their ability to return to com- competition without, you know, getting re-injured, or whether they believe they're able to withstand the demands of sport or to manage pain and those kinds of things. But in terms of the meaning or interpretation of those findings, I think there's a lot less research and you know if if someone scores high or low on one of these assessments well what does that actually mean in terms of their likelihood of return of risk of of re-injury or certain performance kinds of outcomes objective uh, indicators of performance Um, so yeah um you know I think it's it's certainly an interesting and as you say kind of a challenging area to to work in because it's probably not just an exact science but I imagine there's also some art to knowing well when is the athlete ready to actually get back and and compete and and also you know I think you've alluded this to this in many of your comments the readiness probably just isn't something that happens at the end but is really a consequence of all of the things that have gone on throughout the course of their rehabilitation and you continue to use that word a process well re- readiness is probably a process i think as well and you know it's a, sort of you don't just magically get ready at the end of something if you haven't done all the preceding steps and if you have a supportive environment if you've had trust in competent practitioners if you've been motivated and compliant, engaged in these behavioral kinds of things that you talked about uh, in such detail, I, you know, that all seems to foster into these perceptions of readiness. Um, But I I just had, yeah. It'd be really interesting to see like taking those, like I've thought about how to use those readiness scales of really, um, you know, if, if we felt like they are ready physically and they take that test, um, you know, where, where do they, where do most of them stand or taking that test and, and then you find out that they're not, you know, we don't think they're physically ready. Like, do they come up together? You know what I mean? Like if, if we're seeing them pass the functional tests, is their psychological readiness, um, mostly good as well, you know? And that's where I was thinking like when, Cause I'm basically, I'm on this committee for the hospital and they're, they're treating more like high school kids and, and, and don't have the resources that I have basically up at the university. And I'm trying to kind of take what we do up at the university and somehow improve, you know, our process with the, 
with the kind of the high school athlete in that and can can we use some of this and I was thinking you know where the those those some of those kids get lost in that process of getting back to return to play um let's say a physical therapist meets with them at that six month mark gives them that readiness you know test and they just score pretty poor and then they do the functional tests and they realize they're scoring pretty poor on that as well like can we then take that like yeah they're psychologically not ready because they're not functionally ready as well like right. I, w right. I would love to see if they play a, a part in each other because like i feel like they would <laughs> like yeah. I, at least yeah. i feel like they'll still have some worry and all that but i think they'll test a lot more um higher if if we've got them functionally ready or and or do you have you know do you have this kid that really looks amazing functionally and yet they're kind of a worrier or they have you know some more mental issues anyway and they're they are scoring low on that well maybe that's when we need to get them some help you know to kind of help them bridge that gap and yeah you know, it'd be interesting to see like if you see them both up or if you if you see one up and one down well then this kid is that's saying that they're they're ready and you're like uh functionally you're not ready we've got to like bring that back you know together and yeah. i think it can be at least knowledge in our mind but it is like what what can we do with it more like i feel like as a clinician i really want to figure out how can we use that and and i think it'll be somewhat practical in a sense but uh i think they'll play a part in each other and maybe we yeah. can you know if, if we're seeing if we can take care of the functional part then maybe the mental will come up but if it doesn't come up then maybe that's time you you bring in the you know the professional on the mental aspect of it mm -hmm. and and or maybe you know the mental aspect of it you know they're working with a psychologist and and they don't feel ready well then we find out that they're not even ready physically and and you know they can bring that more in i don't know yeah no you know? i i mean i think those are great questions and as a side note, I'd love to chat more. I mean, maybe that's something we can work on as, as a research project um, with the athletes, because I think it it is, you know, it, not just from a academic or intellectual as an intellectual exercise, but from a practical standpoint, do those two kind of elements go hand in hand? Is one sort of fostering the other in some ways, and you know, I think it's sort of the larger question is, well, um, how can um, kind of the, the readiness maybe be developed? So it's not like you need to bring someone sort of, well, we'll bring in the sports psychologist at the end when it's apparent that the athlete is having some problems or they're, they're not ready. But right. more and kind of I think what you're alluding to is, well, can by the end of the ACL eight, nine months, whatever it is, period, uh, if we're addressing the physical, maybe can we, by doing sort of what you do, can then the psychological be enhanced so that it's not, you're maximizing the likelihood that someone is then psychologically ready to return and maybe minimizing the chance that, oh, well, they're not psychologically ready and yeah, we've got to bring in, you know, the, right. the yeah, not, yeah. I feel like we can, I, I really think there's some stuff that we can do all along to like, for the majority of the kids, bring them ready, right. You know, together. Yeah. And I think, I think you'd see it play a part. And I also think, I think if you're working on the psychological part on the early end, then you're you're going to see a bump up in the physical and the physical is going to bump up that i like i just think they play such a part together and i think that's just you see the kids that are are you know a little bit i don't know if it's stronger or, you know they're they're doing some of that on their own you just see how it, it you know one affects the other and i think if we can just make it a smoother process then they you're going to see you know the ones that maybe maybe the ones that are struggling mentally a little bit more you're you're catching them earlier than you're yeah. you know then then like you said when it's almost too late and and or we can just improve the whole process in general because they're they're both playing on each other you know like i said before i think the ones that are really struggling mentally have a hard time coming in and, and working through the physical aspect of it but the physical aspect of it kind of helps their mental aspect of it because they're seeing progress and i don't know they play such yeah. a part of in each other for sure right well and i think you know 
again, it would be interesting just to have some repeated assessment of, you know, you could ask them, there's this one readiness questionnaire where maybe asking them about their readiness to engage in certain things. And presumably early on in the rehabilitation, they might not be so ready because they're physically, um, you know, they're more incapacitations. Uh, but it would be interesting to kind of track that kind of readiness to engage in things over time as they're, you know, also maybe getting assessed on all of the, the physical components of their injury um, and, and to just see kind of how those two are interacting or the interplay between them over the course yeah. of the rehabilitation. Um, yeah, let, let's chat more about it. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm keen to pursue something along those lines. Um, I just have two other questions and I okay. have taken a lot of your time, Laurie, already. So thank you You're very so much. You're so fine, yeah. Um, our, you know, we've talked a lot about the challenges of injury. Are there any benefits or upsides to the experience? I, I, I really think there is. I mean, anything that's really hard and you get through it and I feel like you grow. I, I would definitely watch these kids grow in this process. And I, I absolutely love seeing a kid maybe a year later come in and tell me, you know, how excited they are that they're playing in the game and and what they've done and how hard that process was but I'm so glad I'm through it and you know I just you can see a kid grow no doubt in that process I don't think they'd say it's fun growth but I think I think it's something in their um, background that will always be um, you know they conquered conquered something and I think it will help them in life um, that they took on something really hard and and worked through it um, I think, I think just that, uh, sitting on the sidelines and, and not being able to play, uh, can really, you know, take that, um, you know, being in sport for granted. Like you just really learn to have more passion for your sport. Um, I think it can go both ways. I think sometimes it, it takes away the passion maybe, and you find out that, you know, it's not as important as it was, but I think for most athletes, it, it kind of builds a increase of passion to be out there. I think you see some of your, your teammates complaining about running and complaining about practice and how hard it was, and you're just dying to be out there. And I just think it, you know, it just builds in you as you're sitting there and just, you can't wait to work harder to, to be able to be out there and, and you're never going to complain about practice. You know, I feel like right, they just right. never take it for granted again. And, yeah. um, I, I think you can really be a better athlete when you come out of that because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, just like we said, where, you, you know, maybe you're, you've got a, not a weakness, but something that you can work on. Um, I really think there's, if you take advantage of this time where you're not being able to be in practice, but, maybe you're being a better film watcher maybe you're you're learning the game a little bit more maybe you're coming in as a coach's perspective a little bit more um i think you can really grow as an athlete because of that uh and so i feel like they can take advantage of that um i mean my goal in rehab is i always want them stronger than they were before they came in <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, before they got hurt um a lot of times they might've got hurt because they, they had some imbalances or weaknesses or um, inflexibilities or, or whatever it is. I'm always trying to assess them and seeing if I can, you know, even get them moving a little bit better, making them a better athlete. Yeah. And so I, I do think, um, I think you can come out stronger on the other end. Um, and so, so yeah, I feel like those are the few benefits. I think they're not fun. They're not fun benefits. I don't, I don't think athletes want right. to hear that, right, right. <laughs> but I think they would tell you on the other end that, um, that some of that is true. Like yeah. I, I really yeah. do. So yeah. the benefits are not easily attained, but they're, they're still there to be had, I guess, or. Uh, yeah. And I think it's more an after, I think sometimes when you're talking to them during that, they're, they're kind of rolling their eyes like this doesn't seem like there's going to be any benefit here. You know, I just yeah. feel like they're, it does, they don't feel that as much. Some of them will grasp onto that, but um, I try to talk them through that of trying to tell them that that, that, is, that can really be true. 
Um, I think if you talk to athletes that have been through it, they'll, they'll tell them the same. And sometimes I'd love other athletes to, to talk them through that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, I've seen, I've seen kids that, you know, the, a lot of physical therapists were, <laughs> were athletes that were hurt. And I think sometimes it can open up doors of some, some injured kids end up being coaches and some end up being, you know, doctors or physical therapists. And I think that it makes them more passionate down the road of, of going, you know, doing that. So I think it opens up avenues for, you know, next after sport you know life in a sense and so i i do think sometimes people will say that as well my last question are if you were to share one piece of advice for injured athletes what would it be Hmm. maybe maybe that 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 there there is some hope after injury i think there's um can be some positiveness after injury i think it's really hard to see when you're in it um and and that'd probably be it um that this but i i feel like sometimes you can say that it's just so hard to hear during during the process you know so um but maybe maybe just um to to trust who's around you to find find that person that is going to be your support uh i think that's really really necessary and it it may might just be one person um but find that support and also for them to really understand that you know the best of the best have been injured i think sometimes it it's they feel like it's such a weakness and and they're just so hard on themselves during the process and I think there's just just this understanding that it's just part of being an athlete and right. and and trying to see that you know who who there's been other athletes that are just you know on top and they get injured and they get through it and I think sometimes they just need to know they're that it, it other people have you know have gone through that and it doesn't make them weaker and they can be stronger after and and yeah probably that yeah <laughs> great. Thank you so much for your time, Lori. And again, you shared so many thoughts and, and valuable experiences and, and ideas and, and um, suggestions. So um, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. I know that any injured athlete that takes some time to listen to our conversation, I'm sure will benefit from hearing what you sh- uh, said and, and shared. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you.